Hello, I'm Matt Carpenter, and this is the Good Life Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Good Life Podcast. I am honored today to have my former pastor, Rich Lusk, on with us. Rich is the pastor of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. So, Rich, thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Matt. Uh, There's, as I said, Rich was our pastor from 2013 to 2017. Uh, when we were we drove an hour each each way just because we wanted to hear him preach and we wanted to fellowship <laughs> with the people at T, at TPC. So and, and I know that about the preaching, Matt. I mean, that would have been a lot of pressure. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say that at the time. <laughs> no, but but it, you know, it was good. And and for for those who you know who are familiar with our church, uh, Trinity in Birmingham helped to to start. Our church, Trinity Prez, up here, or Trinity Reformed in Huntsville. So Rich was instrumental in that. And he's written several books. Now, now something I did not know until uh, I was at, I was going through the, uh, TPC's website is that Rich has his, his undergraduate degree in microbiology from Auburn. Rich, you never discuss your microbiology degree. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> I mean, I would. I, I, I have I, long I, since forgotten whatever microbiology I I knew. I'm afraid. I, I, well, I, I was just I was trying trying to rack my brain thinking. Did he ever use a good bi- biology metaphor from the pulpit very much? And and I, I don't recall. Maybe you did. And I just don't recall it. Uh, so I remember a lot more Tolkien and Lewis though than uh, than genomes and stuff like that yeah that's that's probably uh probably uh for the best I, I, yeah had you made too many microbiology references we may not have joined trinity <laughs> in Birmingham. <laughs> so anyway but rich has written several books uh one really good book on pedo communion called pedo faith uh, a primer on the mystery of infant salvation and a handbook for covenant parents. But today we're going to emphasize his book on Ruth. So he's written a very short commentary called Ruth Through New Eyes Under His Wings, and it's published by uh, Athanasius. Is that That's right, Rich? Yeah, Adam Monroe, Louisiana. Press in Monroe. Uh, we're also Rich formerly served in Monroe as associate pastor. But a lot of times when we when we approach Ruth, the, the girls usually like it. Women like Ruth for obvious reasons. They picture Boaz as something like you know Richard Gere uh, in his early fifties or something. And, you know, so it's just, it it goes along that way, but while we don't know what Boaz looked like, uh, except from the, you know, Bible story books of which there's no, we have no idea the accuracy there. uh, Just tell us, Rich, what motivated you to pursue Ruth as, because, you know, I I know you've talked through it before. What drew you to this book to begin with? Yeah, well, and I should point out the the commentary that I wrote uh, is co-authored with Yuri Brito. Yuri and I have worked on a number of projects together, and uh, this book really grew out of a Sunday school series that I did. Oh, it's been 20, 20 years ago now, probably. Uh, but I've come back to Ruth several times since then, and I found it's a book that is well worth revisiting. In fact, even. Now, having written a commentary on it, uh, I still find myself, when I come back to Ruth, finding new insights, things I didn't notice before, uh, little gems that uh, had escaped me previously. But uh, what drew me to the book really was it, it seemed to me that Ruth was a very compact way. You know, it, it's a very compact story. It's a very short story. It's it's four very short uh, chapters. Uh, it, it's It's... Uh, and, and an easy story to summarize. And it seemed to me that Ruth, in a way, was a 
four chapter summary really of the whole gospel message, you might say of the whole Bible. And so there are a number of larger themes in the Bible that are, you could say, really encapsulated or crystallized in the book of Ruth. And I think that that's something that's important to understand about Bible reading. The Bible tells one big story from beginning to end, but within that one big story, of course, you have many smaller stories. And many of those smaller stories are microcosms of the whole. They're ways of retelling the whole. And in a way, that's really what you have in the book of Ruth. Uh, certainly, it is a, a lovely tale. You mentioned how it how it appeals to the ladies, and that that's certainly fine. Uh, that, that's certainly true. I would agree with that. It's a, it's a romantic story. There's no doubt about that, a kind of love story. You can't get around that. But it's it's also redemptive history. And I think to me, that's the most important thing is that it is a typological story that really uh, presents to us, I think, in a really compelling way, the gospel and shows us what God is doing. Uh, Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and the other figures in the story, of course, are, are historical persons. There's no doubt about that. But they are much, much more than mere historical persons. Uh, they, are, they are symbols. They are types. They are uh, vehicles of divine revelation that show us. Us, uh, what God is doing in history from their vantage point, what God will do in history, what he will do for Israel, what he will do for his people. So uh, I was really drawn to Ruth because it's, it's just a really enjoyable story, uh, but there's a lot more uh, going on than just what's on the surface. So to begin with, then what was the intent, as far as you can tell, of the author in writing this book? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that uh, one way to think about the book of Ruth, and, and we do talk about this some of the commentary, there are a lot of different ways to understand what this book is about and what it's doing. And I think that's true of all biblical books. You know, Anytime you're, you're reading a particular book in the Bible, you can ask, what was its purpose? And you can ask, what is its purpose in terms of redemptive history? What does it show us? How does it contribute to the overarching story of scripture? But you can also ask questions more focus more narrowly on the content of that book, uh, what's happening within that book. And I think within the book of, of Ruth, if you look at where it is situated historically uh, and how it comes down to us and how it becomes part of the canon of scripture, I think there's a really strong case that can be made for seeing the book of Ruth as an apologetic for uh, David's kingship for David's right to the throne. It, it, it It's funny to think of a romantic story like this, a kind of love story as uh, a work of apologetics. But I think in its original context, that's a big part of what this is, is it is a defense of uh, David's um, position as king. And the book is probably written at a time when there's a lot of controversy in Israel over whether or not David can be the rightful um possessor of the throne, in part because of his Moabites heritage. And so the book answers that. And I think that's why the book ends the way it does with a genealogy that ends with David, that David is the 10th in line from that genealogy. There was actually, if you go back to Deuteronomy, a law about uh, excluding uh, descendants of Moabites to the 10th generation. And so here you have an answer to a key objection that could have been brought against David's kingship. Uh, there are other ways in which it might uh, be used to bolster or defend David's reign as well, uh, particularly looking at the character of Boaz and Boaz as a kind of proto monarchical figure. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's a big part of what's happening in this book is it is a defense of David's kingship. And so we might, by analogy, talk about ways in which we defend Jesus as the greater David and his right to rule the whole cosmos, uh, his right to the throne of the universe, his, his right to, we could say, the throne of David to be seated at God's right hand. So I think in that sense, Ruth is, is a very helpful model for us. Uh, a lot of times when we think about doing apologetics, we think in terms of very philosophical arguments or evidential arguments, and those definitely have their place. And I think you can find a lot of raw material to make those kinds of arguments in scripture. But we also need to think in terms of stories and songs and poetry. And here we have a story, uh, a very compelling story that I think, again, serves as a defense of the man that God put on the throne. One of the quotes you have in there that I underlined and and 
even copied out because it was so significant to me along the lines of what you just said. Quote, defending faith in Christ is not just a matter of arguments and syllogisms. Many times it's a matter of telling stories. We need to learn to tell the story of the gospel to our culture in such a way the gospel story exposes what is wrong with our culture and sets things right, end quote. So we are already getting somewhat away from the actual story of Ruth, but that's good. That, that's fine. Why has storytelling fallen as a means of communicating the gospel in our circles. I can't speak for other, you know, for, for other groups outside of evangelical circles, but why is it not something you see very much of today? Yeah, Matt, it's a great question. And it's one that I do think we need to wrestle with if we want to be effective evangelists and apologists in our culture. Uh, well, not the, I would say for many reasons, but uh, not the least of those is the fact that uh, people in our culture today don't have a lot of patience with um, reasoned out syllogisms and, and, and that sort of thing. And I'm not saying that that's good. It's not good at all. Uh, but, uh, I do think a lot of times people are willing to listen to a story. And so you might open doors to the gospel, open doors for the gospel with stories that you couldn't get open with syllogisms. But why, but having said that the church is not very good at this. We're not very good at telling stories. Why don't we have better storytellers in the church? And I don't just mean, why don't we have people who are better at telling the story? Uh, but we don't even have people who are particularly good at telling their own stories uh, or, or creating, cra cra crafting stories, say the way that uh, Lewis crafted the Chronicles of Narnia tales or, or Tolkien crafted his Lord of the Rings stories. Uh, and I'm not, obviously not everybody can be a Tolkien or a Lewis, but, but the point is, I think this is an area where we really, really struggle. I think the number one reason is because we don't know what to do with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is full of stories. And yet most of the time, what will happen when those Old Testament stories are preached, one of two things will happen. Either the, the, the preacher will use those stories to illustrate a particular doctrine, and so the story, and you know, God could have just told us that he providentially rules, rules all things. Instead, he gave us a story, like say the story of Joseph or even the book of Ruth. I think that this, this would be a theme or in the story of Esther he said, God's given us a story to illustrate these doctrines. Okay. I do agree with the point that the stories illustrate the doctrines. No question about that, but that is not why those stories are given to us. That's not the fundamental reason why they are given to us. And that would be a very roundabout way to teach those doctrines. Uh, that that's not the main purpose of the stories to convey those doctrines. That's one thing you hear. And that's really kind of, I think, the more common uh, reformed approach is to see all these stories illustrate that we're sinners and we can only be justified by faith. Or all of these stories illustrate God's sovereignty in some way. All that may be true, but that's not their main point. I think in more broad evangelical circles, the stories will be moralized. And so the stories become characters either to imitate or to shun their example. But the point is, everything is filtered through the morality uh, of it. And again, there, there are many very legitimate questions, important questions to ask about the morality of what happens in various stories. Where, when, when Abraham tells Sarah to deceive Elimelech, is that right or is that wrong? That's an, that's an important feature to that story. Uh, what, say, amongst the characters in the book of Judges can be imitated and what should not be? Uh, in what way is David possibly a model for us? Uh, either to emulate or to avoid. You, you can ask those questions. I think that's perfectly appropriate. There are places where biblical characters are used as examples. But again, moralizing those Old Testament stories still misses the main point. You could teach all of that ethical content without the story. And what happens is, whether you doctrinalize or moralize, is the story kind of becomes a husk, and you peel away the husk to get to the real kernel of truth, which is either some doctrine or some... Uh, moral principle. And if that's what we're going to do with these stories, they might as well be Aesop's fables or something like that. We the, None of these things really had to happen. It doesn't really make that much of a difference whether or not they happen. I think what's, I think the re, if we want to really recover storytelling as an art, and if we really want to understand how stories work, we've got to be able to dig in the Old Testament and understand what God is doing. And, and what you find is these stories are given to us 
to show us God maturing his people through history. That's part of it. And ultimately to show us the coming Messiah and what, what, what Messiah will do. And so this is a very oversimplified way to think about it, but it's very obviously a big part of what's happening in the book of Ruth is, you know, throughout the Old Testament, you have Christ figures, you have bride figures, you have Satan figures. If you can figure out what the basic archetypes are, then you can understand what kind of character you have in the story. So it's very, and I may be getting ahead of the question you're asking here, Matt, but uh, it's very obvious in the book of Ruth, we are supposed to see in Boaz a portrait of the kind of husband the kind of king, even the kind of warrior and messiah that God's people ultimately need. That, that's what Boaz is portraying for us in history. And of course, Naomi and Ruth, a, a kind of composite of Naomi and Ruth together, they're the bride, uh, the bride that's in need of rescue, the bride that needs to be redeemed, the bride that needs to be uh, given an heir. Uh, and so it, you can really understand Naomi and Ruth together as a kind of picture of Israel and Israel's condition at that point in history, or even uh, more than that, you can kind of, you can see in them a picture of the church. Uh, and so then if you've got Boaz as a picture of Jesus and Naomi and Ruth as a picture of the church, now you're, you've really got something in this story that's very meaningful to Christians. And uh, we can start to see, oh, what God was doing through their actions in history really gives us a foreshadowing of what Jesus would come and do in history for his people. And this seems to be how Jesus himself read the Old Testament. After his resurrection, when he is with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and certainly it's not the only time that it, that, that, that it happens. We've got other places that we could point to where you see this kind of thing happening. But on the Emmaus Road, this is probably the most famous example of this. Jesus makes it clear that the entire Old Testament, Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, all of it is about the suffering and the glory of the Messiah, the suffering he would go through and the glory he would enter into. And really what you see in Boaz is a beautiful picture of that. And what you see in Ruth and Naomi together is a beautiful picture of what it means to be the people of God and to have a greater Boaz who has come to our rescue. Wow. Well, I hope everybody's enjoyed the podcast. We've covered about everything we need to cover. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, but that, 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 that's, that's, that's a really significant statement. I, I, when you were talking, I, I thought about Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which sadly I, I don't think is taught in any seminary, uh, liberal or conservative now. But... And, and while Campbell is not even not approaching anything about stories or, or, or archetypes from a Christian perspective, there are things learning to read the Bible in that way, not as well as Tolkien called it, the true myth, would go a long way to helping cut through all the the pink postmodern fog that, that that seems to have settled upon us that, that really does a number on our syllogisms. But it, it if you have the wisdom of stories of and the biblical story, that's not some postmodernism does not rearrange that it cannot rearrange that the same way that it has with our you know tightly reasoned arguments mm. so yeah, that, that, that that's really good and that's such an important point i want to i want to add one other thing to what i said matt just so there's no misunderstanding i'm not saying that we reduce old testament stories to allegories no uh, that, that would be just as destructive of the text as just doctrinalizing or just moralizing. And again, I'm, on a, I'm also not dismissing doctrinal principles or illustrations that can be drawn from the text or moral principles that can be drawn from the text. All of that's there. What I'm really saying is that if you want to get the whole package, we've got to learn to read these stories typologically, or you could right. say Christologically, because when, when we as Christians talk about, uh, you know, so, so here, here's a way to think about it. The Old Testament does not need to be Christianized it's always already been a Christian book. It's just a matter of discovering how that is the case. And so if you ask, 
the question we need to ask about the book of Ruth, the question would be, how is Ruth Christian scripture? How does it function as Christian scripture? And the only way I think to answer that question truthfully and fully is to understand the typological or Christological dimensions of the text. So it all really happened in history. And that's really important to understand. It's, it's not, I'm not reducing it just to ideas or anything like that or, or mere symbols. Uh, but what I am saying is that the historical events themselves prefigure what is to come in history. Uh, God is the great storyteller and history is his story. And again, he's telling one big story, but within that one big story, there are many miniature stories that give us insight into the whole so that Ruth is a microcosm of the macrocosm. Um, I actually think one way to get at this is through the medieval quadriga, the, the fourfold sense that the medievals talked about. Now, they abused the the. The, the system, the fourfold sense in many ways. And by the time you got to the Reformation, the reformers had to engage in a really big cleanup when it came to biblical interpretation. But the reformers did not do away with Christological or typological readings of the Old Testament. They, I think they really sharpened them and focused them. And I think they also showed that a lot of the um, ways that the medieval church had come to read the text allegorically was not Christological. They were reading the text allegorically, but to connect it with, say, Greek philosophy or other other things, um, you know, rather than the gospel itself. So and, and let me explain what I mean by that. The quadriga or the full fourfold sense. Basically, there are two senses to these historical texts in Scripture. There is the literal sense and the spiritual sense. And the literal sense is a historical record of what actually happened as it's recorded for us in scripture. And we, we know that that historical record of what actually happened is faithful and true. The spiritual sense then is what you could say is the meaning of those events. These are not just bare meaningless facts. It's not a bare record of what happened. Rather, it's, it's what scripture is giving us is the events and their meaning. And that meaning is found in the spiritual sense. And the spiritual sense has, you could say, three subsenses. So this is why you talk Talk about the quadriga, the fourfold sense of scripture. You got the literal historical sense, and then these three spiritual senses, which is the, the, the typological, the tropological, and the eschatological. Those are not necessarily the, the names they use. They would talk about the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical. But I, I prefer to talk about the typological, the tropological, and the eschatological. So the typological is basically uh, Augustine's first rule of interpretation in his book on Christian doctrine, where he says, the key to understanding the Bible is to understand uh, the, the, the principle of totus Christus, that when the Bible talks about Christ, it's talking about the whole Christ head and body. It's always the Christ and his people. And so again, if you've got a, a Christ figure in a story, you should also be looking for a bride figure in, in the story, head and body. Uh, bridegroom and bride always together. The moral, of course, is that sense in which the text teaches us something about how God would have us to live, how this text helps us to fulfill uh, the rule of love. It's not just what we should believe. It's also what it's going to have implications for what we should do. And then the anagogical or eschatological is going to in some way point us to the ultimate fulfillment of all things. Not every Old Testament text is going to have you know, those three subsenses in exactly the same way. But most of the time, it's not that hard to tease them out. And I, it's really clear, obviously, from the New Testament, the most important of these to grasp is the typological or the Christological dimension of the text, because everything else is going to flow out of that. So, uh, I, and again, there were a lot of problems with the way that some medieval churchmen and some medieval theologians interpreted the Bible. I'm not endorsing everything they had to say. But if you go back and you read something like... Um, Henri de Lubac's book, Medieval mm -hmm. Exegesis. Right. Very interesting and actually very, and, and, and it's really quite careful. Or Jean Danielou's book. Uh, he's actually right. got a couple books. One is the is on the liturgy that basically shows how the early Christians derived a lot of their liturgical practices from a typological or, or uh, spiritual reading of scripture. They use the fourfold method uh, as a way of guiding their liturgical theology and liturgical practices. He's also got a book called from, I think it's called from shadow to reality or from symbol right. to yeah. reality. Yeah. And, and it does the same kind of thing, but with just a number of Old Testament narratives where he shows how these stories in the Old Testament, these historical accounts in the Old Testament were typological and the New Testament itself brings them to fulfillment. And so I think the question we have to ask is, how, what would Jesus and the apostles do with this text? How would they read it? We don't have a comprehensive commentary on the Old Testament 
given to us by Jesus or the apostles, but we have some really clear case studies in how they interpreted the Old Testament. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 10, how Paul interprets the event of the Exodus and connects that with the church's experience and even is able to translate from the Red Sea crossing with the water that poured down from above and their baptism into the cloud and into Moses, how that points to Christian baptism and the manna from heaven, the water from the rock that pointed to uh, the Christian sacrament of the Lord's Supper and all of that. Uh, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, connecting the flood with Christian baptism. Uh, those are sacramental examples. Obviously, they're not all not all of these cases are sacramental, but th those are a couple of examples of where the apostles take an Old Testament story and they interpret it for us. And they're not Christianizing a non-Christian story. They're showing us the meaning that was latent and that was built into it all along that now has come to its full uh, fruition through the death and resurrection of Jesus in, in his church. And that's not even getting to the dozens and dozens of symbols in the book of revelation. Oh, sure. Right. That, right. that, that, that John is, he, he just pulls and it's so dense because there are more old Testament pictures packed into that apocalyptic story. Yes. Than we have brain space for. Right. And they're not pictures just from the Psalms and Proverbs. They're from Leviticus and Amos and, and Ezekiel. you know, uh, right, Ezekiel. All of, so right. it's and so one has to be familiar with all of Scripture in order yeah, let's, to start let, let's to think say about let's say that you had forty years to master the Book of Revelation. You should spend thirty nine of those years studying the Old Testament. Yes. And then you're ready to study yes. Revelation. Exactly. Now that sounds kind of intimidating. You don't have to literally do it that way. But my point is the key that unlocks so much of the New Testament is the Old Testament. And you can, Revelation's maybe a good example of that. But th this, is the, this is the whole issue between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew their Old Testament, but they did not read it rightly because they did not read it typologically. Right. They were doctrinalizing and moralizing the Old Testament. Fundamentalist. It's its whole purpose that is, the, you know, is how the text finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And, and, and again, I think the Gospels are written. You know, it's interesting. Um, the Gospels are, are a good test case for this. Um, all of them, maybe especially John, but all of the Gospels are this way. The Gospels are not written to show us that Jesus meticulously uh, kept every single law of the Torah so he did not sin. We know that's true, that he was sinless. But it's not like the gospel writers gave us a record of Jesus fulfilling each one of these commandments. What they have done is they have shown us how Jesus brings the stories of the Old Testament to fulfillment in himself by recapitulating them. It's as if Jesus relives the history of Israel, but now he does it right. So what Israel should have right. done, now Jesus will do. So um, Matthew's gospel parallels the whole history of Israel, um, really the, the, the entirety of, of, of Old Covenant Israel's history. And basically Jesus relives that history, but he does so as a faithful Israel. He is the faithful Israelite. Matthew's written to show us that. So the experience that, say, Israel goes through with her own baptism in the Red Sea crossing and then wilderness wandering, facing temptation and uh, going to Mount Sinai to receive the law and all of these things, that the, the life of Jesus in Matthew's gospel tracks with each one of those events. Only what happens is when Jesus is tempted, unlike Israel, he doesn't give in. Uh, when, when Jesus receives the law, he doesn't break the law. Or, you know, he's actually giving the law. He's not, um, he's not receiving the law the way the Israelites did because he's the law giver. But it's really clear he's, he's the one who is going to fulfill this law perfectly. And fulfill does not just mean keep the commandments. It means actually realize the fullness of its purposes. Uh, God's redemptive purposes are coming to fulfillment in him. So he's recapitulating. That, that's a word that the church fathers would sometimes, sometimes use. Recapitulating Israel's history and bringing it to fulfillment. Hmm. Well, from there then, t taking this perspective, let's get into Ruth itself. You start out in the book, talking about Elimelech, the 
the picture, as you say, uh, who is a picture of the first Adam. So, you know, we meet Elimelech and, and his wife, Naomi, and, and then their sons, Malon, Kilion, and, who then marry Moabite women. So talk, and then of course, they, they leave Bethlehem and go to Moab. And we could spend the rest of our time just talking about the name, their names and what right. they mean. But what is significant? What, what are just a few of the most significant things that you see in that opening few verses of chapter one? Yeah. Well, let me give you an example of what's happening here. Um, we know that the architecture of biblical theology, so to speak, um, everything is really structured around the two atoms. So, for example, uh, Paul in Romans chapter five talks about the first atom and the and the second atom, or the first atom and the last atom. He does the same thing in First Corinthians uh, fifteen. And so, if you think about if you're talking about the architecture of the Bible, the overall structure of the Bible, everything is structured around these two federal heads: the first atom and the last atom. The first atom fails, and so a second atom has to come and take his place and do what the first atom should have done. Well, First Samuel is First and Second Samuel are really structured the same way. In First and Second Samuel, that's really one story. It's First and Second because of the the, the way the scrolls were, the, the 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 length of the scroll is what really dictates that. But it's one book. Uh, so in the book of Samuel, the whole thing is really structured around two Adam figures, and they're they're very obviously presented as new Adams, Saul and David. The first Adam falls, Saul, and so a second. Adam, David, has to come and take his place and do what the first Adam, Saul, in that case, failed to do. Now, of course, because David is not the true final Adam, the true second Adam, he's got his own failures. Uh, but uh, you can see that's the structure of the book, and, and that's what's happening. Same thing is going on in Ruth. We've got a two-Adam structure. You've got Elimelech and those who are associated with him, his sons, and then you've got Boaz. It's a two atom structure. The first atom's going to fall. The second atom will come and do what the first atom failed to do. He will accomplish what the first atom should have accomplished and did not. So what happens with Elimelech? Well, uh, yeah, it's a famine. Uh, and we know from the book of Deuteronomy, if there was a famine in the land, it's probably because the people are in sin. It's, it's a judgment for their sin. The Land is a land flowing with milk and honey. If that flow has been stopped up and the land is no longer a new Eden, full of food, full of prosperity for the people, it's probably a judgment for sin. And so rather than fleeing away to Moab, which if you know anything about the history of Israel's interactions with Moab, that'd be the last place you'd want to go. Right. But, and I won't, I won't go into all of that. If you want more on that, maybe just read the commentary. But, uh, he, he takes his family away from Bethlehem, which means house of bread, away from the house of bread to Moab. Instead of staying put and repenting, which seems to be what the godly Israelites did, like Boaz, as we find out later on in the story, uh, Elimelech runs away and he finds Moab to be a place of death. He dies, his two sons die, and that's it. It looks like the end of the line for Elimelech. And so you, you really what's happened here, I, th I think the way to understand this is this is a kind of self-inflicted exile for Elimelech. He takes himself out of the land of promise. Well, that was the curse of the covenant that Moses threatened in Deuteronomy. Moses said, if you hmm. sin, I'll send famine. Moses said, if you sin, I'll ultimately drive you out of the land. Well, Elimelech has taken himself out of the promise of land on his own. So he really has put himself under the curse of exile. And that's really, that sets up the problem that then the rest of the book is going to solve. Here at the very beginning, you've got exile, you've got curse, you've got death, you've got uh, a family line that seems to be at an end. What's going to happen? Can those problems be solved? Man. So... They do have a significant problem. And then, of course, the problem worsens when he dies. His sons die. And then Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law. And you used a phrase <coughs> that I had not heard before. You called Naomi an anti-evangelist. 
<laughs> now, for a former Southern Baptist, that would be like essentially calling her a pagan, but but because that's a very important thing. So, what do you mean when, when you say that she was an anti-evangelist uh, in in the role that she plays? Well, with her husband and her sons dead, uh, she has no choice but to return to her country. Uh, to the land of promise and hope that there is somebody there who will take care of her. And so at first her two uh, daughters-in-law are going to go with her and um, Orpah and Ruth and uh, Naomi. And th this is in chapter one, verse eight, Naomi basically tries to send them back to the pagan households from which they came. Uh, she says, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. So she wants them to get remarried, to have a prosperous life. She she wishes them the best. But here's the thing. They're in Moab. They're, they're in a pagan land. How can that be a good place for them to be? Uh, right. How can they how can they actually experience the Lord's kindness and the Lord's blessing there? Uh, in a land that's devoted to a false God and dominated by a false God. So I do think she's a kind of anti-evangelist. I think Naomi has reached the end of her line. And basically she's saying, look, Yahweh has, has dealt bitterly with me. Maybe he'll deal kindly with you, but he's dealt bitterly with me. Go your own way. You know, go, go do whatever you think is best. Uh, Naomi tries to send them away. This would be like, you know, a Christian who has suffered a great deal of loss and hardship who basically says to um, non-Christians, hey, look, <laughs> you know, God, is, uh, God has been very harsh with me. God has dealt very bitterly with me. Uh, you know, I can't really encourage you to come serve my God because he, he's been very, very harsh with me. And I think that's kind of what Naomi is doing. She has a crisis of faith here. You know, we yeah. don't have to determine whether or not she's a full on apostate in order to understand what's happening in the story. But the point is, she's in a very low place, a very bad place spiritually. She's not in any position to encourage these two young women to uh, come with her to the land of promise. She's sending them away. Uh, it's probably a kind of death wish for Naomi. I don't know that a, that an older woman like Naomi would have been able to make it on her own. Apparently, she was not even able to go glean for herself. She wasn't able to help Ruth when they got back to the land. So uh, it was going to be a very hard existence, a very hard life uh, from here on out for her uh, if she's left all alone. So she sends these two Moabitess uh, women back home. Orpa goes, but Ruth does not. And this is what's interesting. It's kind of, to me, it's kind of like Rahab. Think about Rahab in the book of Joshua. The Israelites, when they came out of Egypt, they should, you know, had they been faithful, they could have marched straight into the promised land, conquered it, settled down. That would have been it. Instead, because of their sin, because of their grumbling, their idolatry, uh, because they turned away from the Lord, they've got to wander in the wilderness for about, you know, a total of 40 years after they come out of, of Egypt. Despite the fact that Israel was so unfaithful, Rahab, living in Jericho, has heard of what the Lord did to the Egyptians, and she has learned to fear the Lord, the God of Israel. And so when they finally show up, she decides, this is the God I want to side with. These are the people I'm going to show my loyalty to. It's not like the Israelites have been great evangelists, living faithful lives, shining like a light into the darkness and Rahab is drawn to that. No, they've been very sinful, very compromised. Nevertheless, Rahab is still drawn to Yahweh, to the true and living God. And that really seems to be what, what's happened with Ruth here, despite the fact that she has not had a very good witness from Elimelech and, and, and from his family. Uh, she wants to go back to the land of Judah with Naomi. And so that's what she does. She basically binds herself in a covenant to Naomi and makes that return journey with her. One of the things I found interesting about the story in rereading the story as I was reading your commentary was Ruth's gradual growth in the covenant. With Ruth, it seems there is a series of turnings toward Yahweh rather than one 
180 degree turn on a dark and stormy night or a dry and desert night, <laughs> there's this, this little by little change. We see her from the beginning exercising childlike faith, which ends up reconverting Naomi. It's amazing how, how this works. But anyway, is, is that a general, is that a correct picture of Ruth and how she, and, and the way that she comes to faith? Yeah, it's, it's one of the ironies of the story that the, the pagan becomes the evangelist and the covenant member is the one that needs converting. It, it, honestly, to me, you know, I, I made the connection with Rahab. It's also a lot like what happens in Luke's gospel, where it seems like insiders become outsiders and outsiders become insiders. And you have kind of this upside down, topsy turvy kingdom. Same kind of thing here, uh, where the, the, you know, true spirituality, true faithfulness comes from the place you would least expect it. Again, I, I made allusion to this earlier, but, um, if you go back in Israel's history, if you rewind back to the period of the Exodus, it was the Moabite women who led the Israelite men astray into immorality and idolatry. Well, now it's going to be a Moabitess woman who actually becomes the model of faithfulness. So yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I do think you could say that Naomi is really reconverted uh, by Ruth's faithfulness. One other thing here, another, and I don't remember if we even put this in the commentary or not. I don't, you know, we didn't have room for everything, every insight. But when when Naomi comes back to the land of promise, it's sort of like, you know, I, I said that it's like Elimelech has gone into exile. Well, what follows exile is Exodus. You know, you get exiled from the land and in Exodus, you're brought back to the land. Exile, you're sent away. Exodus, you're brought back. Well, this is an Exodus. And it's interesting because if you go back to the Exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt, a couple things stand out. One, they come out with plunder. And two, they come out as a mixed multitude. A lot of Egyptians come with them. There are Israelites who, who, uh, who were, who, uh, well, they, they did come out with Egyptian plunder, but they also came out with Egyptians who wanted to be incorporated into the people of Israel. And over that 40 year period of wandering in the wilderness, they were incorporated into the nation of Israel. So Israel does not appear as a mul mixed multitude anymore once they settled in the land, even though we know there were a number of people who had Gentile blood in them who, who, who came out, who were part of that Exodus community. Well, you might ask the question, if, if this is an Exodus, is there plunder? Is there a mixed multitude? And the answer is yes. Naomi is, it says she's coming back empty handed, but really she's oblivious to the way God has blessed her. She's obvious. She's actually got great plunder in Ruth. She's actually coming out of Moab in this new Exodus as a mixed multitude with a Gentile right there by her side with Ruth. So uh, it, it actually fulfills that Exodus pattern. I think very, very well, and that's the kind of thing that you need to notice in Scripture. See, if you just doctrinalize or just moralize, you're going to miss that exile exodus pattern. And really, to me, that's what makes the story make so much sense, is Elimelech has exiled his family. It's a kind of self-imposed, self-inflicted exile. Now we get an exodus, and it might not look like the same kind of exodus you had in the book of Exodus at first coming out of Egypt. But actually, as the story unfolds, we'll find that there's a mixed multitude here and there is plunder. And that plunder actually that the Israelites came out of was used to build the tabernacle. It was used to build the house of the Lord. Well, the plunder that Naomi has come back from Moab with Ruth is going to be used to build the house of the Lord in a different sense. I would say a greater sense through the child that she gives the, the house of the Lord will be built. That's really good. We've talked about, males who were poor examples. Then we meet in chapter two, Boaz. Mm. You get the most discouraging portion out of the way in chapter one. We meet Boaz, uh, the son of Rahab, and just every time you read something else about this man, you like him more and more. There's he he's always doing things that are edifying, that are wise, that are self-controlled. 
tell us a little bit about Boaz and what, what are some of the characteristics that, that you know, that, that are notable about him. I mean, I yeah, mentioned and, some of them, but yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah. Maybe Boaz was especially sensitive to the plight of uh, a foreigner coming into Israel like uh, Ruth, because he had that background um, descending from Rahab, who was a foreigner, obviously was incorporated into the people of Israel. So that's part of it. But, but right off the bat, when we meet Boaz, a couple things stand out. One, he's described as, uh, a relative of Naomi, which is going to become a really important thing. In order to really understand this story, you've got to understand the Leveret Institution and the Kinsman Redeemer Institution from the Old Testament law. Those those are key features uh, that are going to come to fulfillment in this story. So you got to understand that to understand what's fully going on. But he's also described as a worthy man or a mighty man of valor or a mighty warrior. The, the language that is used to describe him is language that describes both, uh, you could say, courage and, well, uh, not, uh, uh, really three things, I think. Courage, character, and competence. Courage, the, the language indicates that probably in his younger days, but obviously this, this would be his reputation. This is what he would be known for. He was a great warrior, uh, a mighty man of war, also a man of competence, uh, a, a skillful man, a man of wisdom, and also a man of um, of character, uh, a man of godly character. All of those things wrapped up together, I think, I, I think all of that's bound up in the way that he's described when we first meet him. Uh, I don't think our English translations do justice or really can do justice to all that's packed into the language that describes him. But uh, he's described as a mighty man, a man of substance, a man of character, uh, the, 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 I think you could say a model man, uh, what a man should be. And uh, another interesting thing that happens at the beginning of chapter two is um, Ruth is going to go glean. And of course, there's a lot that could be said about Old Testament gleaning laws, especially the, the wisdom of Old Testament gleaning laws, say, compared to our welfare state. But we can we can pass that by. But the text is very interesting because it says that Ruth chanced upon the part of the field that belonged to Boaz. Think about it this way. They, you know, they had their houses, they had their, their homes sort of in the city. And then outside the city, they had all these fields and the fields would be would have their boundary lines, obviously. But it's just it's field after field after field. So if you go out to glean, you really don't know whose field you're going into. You're just looking for a field that's uh, that hasn't been harvested all the way to the edges. And so you go out there and you you glean. Uh, that's how that's one of the key ways that the poor were cared for. Uh, and again, you see the wisdom in it because on the one hand, it did not require any bureaucracy. It's, it's highly relational. Uh, it would be up to the landowners themselves to do this, to leave the corners of their fields unharvested. But it also preserves the dignity and builds a work ethic on the part of the poor. They've still got to go work. They've still got to go do, do what they can do. Uh, you know, so for the able-bodied poor, this was a way to, to, um, to provide for yourself. Um, that did not make you a, a pawn of you know, something like a, a welfare state. Uh, so, so that's what you see happening here. But it's really interesting. The way the text describes it, it says that, uh, sh this is in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, she happened to come upon the part of the field. That's how the ESV has it. A more literal reading might say she chanced upon the part of the field. Or you might even say, as luck would have it, she ended up in the part of the field. And of course, the, you know, that sends off alarm alarm bells and buzzers. It's like, wait a second, luck, chance, those are pagan categories, concepts. The Bible rejects those. The Bible talks about God's providence, how God superintends everything. Yes, that's right. But here's the thing. If you want to be a careful literary reader of scripture, and this goes back to what we said about storytelling, uh, you have to understand when, when the author is playing with you, Mm -hmm. And when he's sort of poking at you in order to get your attention, to call your attention to something, of course, she doesn't just happen upon the field. She doesn't get there by chance or by luck. It's obviously God's providence. But this is the this is the author's way of sort of winking at us. Like it's 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 luck. Wink, wink. It's chance. Hmm. Wink, wink. Right. It, to me, it's kind of like what happens in in Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth stories where, you know, all these things happen to Bilbo Baggins. And, and, and the narrator even calls attention to it. You know, he gets one lucky break after another. And, and at the end of the story, 
uh, Gandalf says, you know, do you think all your escapes happen by mere luck? And of course, the whole point is no. Uh, we actually learn from the rest of Tolkien's Middle Earth writings, there is a higher power at work. There's a, there's a personal God, in fact, who created this world, this universe, who created Middle Earth, and he's the one who is superintending all the events therein to fulfill his purposes. And so then you have to ask, well, what are all those references to luck or chance there in the story for? Well, in a way, it, it's a way of showing this was not planned by any, any human agent. Uh, Ruth could not have known what she was doing. Naomi could not have manipulated things to happen in this way. This is God in his providence causing things to happen so nobody else can get any credit for it. God has got to be given all the credit, all the glory for what happens. Uh, but but it's told in a, in a kind of fun, humorous way that, you know, it, it's it's part of the uh, what makes the story so enjoyable is this reference to her chancing upon Boaz's field. When she meets him, he takes notice of her. Likely knowing being a, a man who certainly as Solomon says in Proverbs, be diligent to know the state of your flocks. He, he, he certainly knew not only about his, his own fields, but the people who were coming and going. He, we read that he asks about her. And of course, Naomi's excited when she find, when she discovers all of this. And then they hatch the plan. Naomi hatches the plan, knowing right. that he right. is the one who can, redeem her but go you about to say something well no go, go ahead go ahead finish your thought what just there's the questions from many what on earth was she doing we can easily stumble at that and say she was not doing something appropriate the way that she approaches him on the threshing floor i know we're skipping a lot but yeah, but yeah. you know that it, how could she do that and and, and you provide a, a good answer in the book but touch on that yeah so the, the the relationship between Boaz and Ruth begins to develop as he as you said you know he's he's uh, Boaz because he's a competent and uh, high character man he takes um, he, he takes great pains to make sure that the law. Uh, the gleaning law is fulfilled, so he's a man of mercy, uh, even as he is a man of, of great means. Uh, and when he sees Ruth, of course, he asks his workers in the field about her, gets some information. And then he, I, I, the way I've put it is he gives her most favored gleaning status. He basically, <laughs> while, while she's working hard, no doubt, he enhances what she's able to accomplish. I mean, that's how it is, right? If you're an authority figure and you see people who are working hard, you know, I know the Bible doesn't say God helps those who help themselves, but we want to help people who help themselves. Like we see somebody right. working hard. We want to encourage that hard work. You see somebody's lazy and you're not, you're not as inclined maybe to help them. But Ruth is working really hard and Boaz wants to reward her labors. And so he makes sure that she gets additional um, grain, more than she could have gotten ordinarily. She gets water. He gives her special protection so that nobody can take advantage of her. No doubt a woman in that situation, even in the land of promise, would have been uh, in a vulnerable position if some evil man wanted to take advantage of her. Boaz makes sure that's not going to happen. So so you see the kind of man Boaz is. He's a provider and protector. We kind of think of those as the harm, hallmarks of, of manhood. What do men do? They provide, they protect. That's what Boaz does. He's providing for her by making sure that she's able to glean and even get some extra he and, and get some water. He's protecting her and making sure that no other men will come and, and harass her or assault her, uh, make sure that she's going to be taken care of. And then when Ruth comes home to Naomi, and of course, Naomi is amazed at all that Ruth has been able to uh, bring with her to all the, the great success of her day out gleaning. She wants to know whose field this is. Ruth tells her, and it turns out this is a kinsman of uh, Naomi's family. Well, that kicks into effect what you could call the, the, the kinsman redeemer law. Uh, it also kicks in the leveret marriage law. And I won't go into all the detail here. If you're interested in all the specifics, you can uh, read about them in the commentary. But basically, if you were, uh, if, if a 
uh, if a man died without having a male son to be his heir and carry forward his family name, a close relative could marry that woman and raise up a seed in place of that deceased man who did not have a son of his own. And so that, that's, an, that's an important provision that's going to uh, be significant in this story. And then further, uh, a kinsman redeemer would be someone who, if you were impoverished, if you were enslaved, if, if, if you're in some uh, life-threatening situation, the kinsman redeemer is a, he's exactly, it's exactly what the name implies, a relative of yours who can come to your rescue. And essentially, that's what Boaz is going to do here. But Naomi, so, so when Naomi finds out that she has been in Boaz's field, she says, well, this is a close relative. Uh, and so then she tells uh, Ruth basically to go put herself at his disposal, uh, you know, to dress up like a bride for her wedding and to go put herself at Boaz's disposal as if to, now, here's the thing, you, and if you moralize the story, this is where it's going to get you into trouble. Okay, just like if you're doctrinalizing, you're going to have a, you're going to stumble over the fact that the story says that she chanced upon Boaz's field. If you moralize the story, so you try to turn this into a story about dating advice or something like that, it's going to go sideways really quickly because that's not what this is. Obviously, normally we would say in any um, in, in any romantic relationship between a man and a woman, it, it is best and proper. It's fully appropriate for the man to be the one who takes initiative. That's what we would expect for the men to be the initiators. So you might ask the question, well, why does Ruth seem to improvise here and take the initiative? Well, this is not an ordinary situation and she's not asking for an ordinary dating relationship or an ordinary marriage even. What she is doing is coming to Boaz in the middle of the night on the threshing floor, and basically communicating to him, hey, you're a kinsman. Will you be a kinsman redeemer? Will you raise up a seed through me for the deceased? That's really what's happening. Uh, so uh, she, she's, she, she's, not, she's not giving just a classic marriage proposal to Boaz. She's basically um, approaching Boaz to see if he is willing to play this role as defined and, outlaw, and outlined by the Old Testament law. But there's a twist in the plot. And there's a reason, perhaps, why Boaz has not acted to take initiative. And perhaps, had this not been the case, Boaz would have already taken initiative uh, and and uh, done this himself. And that twist in the plot is that there is a closer relative who basically gets first dibs as to whether or not he's willing to take on this responsibility to raise up uh, a son in place of the deceased Elimelech and his deceased sons. Who will, who will then raise a man to take his place. Again, think in terms of the two Adams. The first Adam falls, another Adam has to be raised up to take his place. That's really what, uh, what Ruth is asking uh, Boaz, uh, Boaz to do. So that, that, that is how that works. And I think if you don't understand the Old Testament law there, you're going to have a hard, because that's the key plot device here. It, it, those features of the Old Testament law, the lover at marriage and the kinsman redeemer, uh, those are the key things to really understand what's happening in the story. And he uses a very cunning, crafty approach, even in dealing with the one who is first in line. Yeah, so we get to the end, and of course, we're we're very, we're all pull, you know, it's kind of like the, the you know. Um, it's like if this was a movie, you know, you're pulling for this couple to get together, but now there's another man that seems to stand in the way. It's like, oh no, what's going to happen? You know, is, is the couple going to get together uh, or not? Well, uh, and, and there's a lot of symbolism that's built into this. There's a lot of, like, you know, for example, Ruth uh, is given by Boaz uh, six ephahs of flour, six something or others of flour to take back to Naomi that night. And basically that's a pledge. It's saying, Here's a six. There's going to be a seventh. You're going to get your rest. You're going to enter into Sabbath rest. You're going to be taken care of one way or the other, whether it's me or another man. You're going to you're going to get that rest that you've been craving, that you desire. Of course, rest here stands not just for physical relaxation, but it's but it but it really stands for um, things being set right. It's it'd be very right. closely related to shalom. It means having a son. It means being fully restored. 
uh, what was lost. Vindication, vindication, all of those. Yeah, all of that's built in. Yeah, absolutely. So all all that's there. Well, so now we want to know what's going to happen. Which which man is going to end up with Ruth? Will it be Boaz, who obviously now we're sort of pulling for, or will it be this other guy? And yes, uh, it's interesting how uh, the way the story is told, the way Boaz acted, it it, it is designed to build suspense. This is one of the things that makes the story so enjoyable. Um, So Boaz, uh, in in chapter four, finds the closer kinsmen, and they gather in front of the elders of the city, who would be the ones to make a judgment or ratify any kind of transaction or marriage or what have you. And uh, Boaz give, gives this nameless man, he's nameless for a reason, uh, he basically gives an account of what's happened, how Naomi has come back from the country of Moab, uh, and, and uh, there's this opportunity to buy this parcel of land, and he says to the man, if you will redeem it, then redeem it. But if you will not, let me know, because there's no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. So I'm next in line in terms of the the order of the relatives that could do this. And at first the man says, I will redeem it. And then Boaz, you know, has been holding back this. It's like he's got his ace in the hole. <laughs> and now he's going to he's going to turn over his cards and he says, OK, but if you buy the, the piece of property, you also get Ruth as a leveret wife, a kind of leveret marriage to raise up a son in place of the deceased. And so basically what that means is the man at his own, ex- he's at first he's just thinking, well, I can expand my holdings. I can expand my real estate portfolio. I can buy this land at a good price and it will be in my family and I pass it on to my heirs. Well, now he finds out that he's going to have to raise up a son for another man, for Elimelech. And that's going to come at his own expense. That's going to be costly to him. And then the land that he buys is going to go to that to that son. And so now it's actually uh, not financially advantageous. It's going to be a sacrifice. Well, this is not the kind of man that wants to make a sacrifice. There's a reason why this man is nameless in the story and his name has been forgotten. His name has been blotted out of history uh, because he would not perpetuate Elimelech's name. His name does not get perpetuated. He becomes nameless because when he finds out that there's going to be some cost to him, some sacrifice on his part, he passes on the deal. And so Boaz then is able to redeem the land, marry Ruth. And of course, the story ends with the son being born and everything that was lost has been restored at the beginning of the story. It's loss of land. It's loss of life. It's loss of of, of sons. Uh, There's curse. There's death. What do you have here at the end? Land's been restored. Air has been raised up uh, in place of, of... of the widows, you now have a, a, a marriage taking place. Uh, the widow finds a new husband. All of that. So every you know, every single domino that fell, now all that gets reversed, and actually then some. It's actually even a far more glorious situation than what you had at the beginning. Uh, the end is better than the beginning because Boaz is greater than Elimelech, and so it's really a glorious story. And there's a glorious symmetry to it. There, there's a there's just a glorious structure to the whole story. And we've not covered so much of what you mention in the book. It is not written at a level that people would find it difficult to understand. So I, I commend it to everyone and they'll have a link to it. Uh, again, it's, it's fantastic. It's called Ruth through new eyes uh, under his wings. And, and you actually under his wings is the last appendix. Yeah. You have two, wonderful appendices. One is on the theology of the land, which we did not have time to get to, but then also what it, you know, the, the meaning of that phrase under his wings. Yeah. So this, the book of Ruth and reading that along with your book, it, it helped me to see the story with, with almost an Arthurian quality to it, with Boaz being like the king mm. and accomplishing the restoration of one who was removed. And even though uh, of Ruth, she, I mean, Boaz says that she, she displayed two kindnesses, the first kindness and second kindness. Her second mm. kindness, you talk about it, was 
the fact that she's willing to do these things for Naomi, not just for herself. And th- this story is romantic, not just in the, 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 the normal sense of, of Eros love, but it, it's romantic just in, in, in the, the sense of high and good drama. It's a powerful story, but a powerful story that presents the gospel. Yep, that's right. As all true romance does. Yes. Uh, because Eros is a created analog of the, I mean, as, as we know, Eros and uh, as yes. marriage itself is, is created to be an analog of the Christ church relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, you're, you're right. And, and you've tapped into what I love so much about this, you know, this story and, and why it is so glorious and so fun to read and uh, why it is so impactful. You mentioned the book, the commentary is, is really accessible. It was designed that way. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, obviously, that could have been said that we leave out of the commentary. We wanted to write a very short, compact commentary. It originally started out as basically just a transcript of some Sunday school classes that I taught. So I, I won't make any claims for it being a great work of, you know, of literature or anything like that. It's not the best written commentary you're ever going to read. Uh, but if you, if you think about it from this, and I think we say this in the introduction, you know, it was, it was basically transcribed from, uh, honestly, so long ago, it was actually cassette recordings of a, of a Sunday school class that I gave. And, you know, that passed through my hands and through Yuri's hands. And we continued to take out things that we thought were extraneous and not necessary for this particular kind of commentary. It's not intended to be ac- you know, academic at a high level. It is intended to open up this portion of scripture to you so you can really understand what's happening in this part of the Bible and how this part of the Bible testifies to Jesus, how this part of the Bible can help us grow in faithfulness and in love, how this part of the Bible can encourage us uh, in all kinds of ways to advance the kingdom of God and to stand for God's truth in the world. And the book of Ruth, I think, is glorious in all those ways. It does all those things for us. Yes. Well, Rich, thank you for joining us today. This has been fantastic. I hope every it will motivate everyone to go to go back and first to read the book of Ruth, then to read your book on it as to help them understand what's going on. So thank you for, for coming on it, and man. talking about yeah, it. Great to be here. Appreciate it very much. Appreciate your ministry. Thank you. The Good Life Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy one of our other podcasts, Got a Minute, featuring Larson Hicks and Rich Lusk. Theology, philosophy, economics, politics, and more for normal people.